Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back to the third part of Sedimentary Rocks Part 2, Part 2. So before we go any further, let's just get the code word out of the way. The code word for this presentation is Shakespeare. I repeat, Shakespeare. That's S-H-A-K-E-S-P-E-A-R-E. -E -E. I repeat, Shakespeare, as in William Shakespeare. So please make sure you write that down and put it somewhere safe. Okay, so let's just finish off the presentation then. So now we've gone through a whole range of different environments of deposition. It's now time to start thinking about how we actually make the interpretation. So how we take our sediments and actually use them to, number one, work out the environment, and number two, work out what was going on on a larger scale. So we obviously always have to take care when we're interpreting the available data because, well, let's look at this conglomerate here. The problem is, is if we don't collect the right information, then it's impossible to tell whether this conglomerate represents a braided river sediment sample or a glacier, or maybe it represents a, uh, a beach environment. So, we, you know, if we don't get the right information, we can't really be sure. So what do we look for? Well, first we would look at the grain sizes. Specifically, is there any mud present? So if we have a look at this particular rock here, what does it look like? Well, we can see we've got these gravel and cobble sized class and the matrix between them on the whole looks quite gritty, which would suggest it's probably a sandy matrix. So probably relatively little mud. So not much silt, not much clay. So that would imply that a, a glacial origin is probably less likely because if you remember, a glacier will produce a very distinctive type of conglomerate, which is called a till. And tills, by their nature, are very clay and silt rich. And so the fact we don't have much clay and silt would imply that we're, we may be looking at a, uh, a braided river system sediment or maybe some kind of beach sediment. So then we look at the geometry. So do we have a shoestring geometry? Well, that would suggest a river, like a braided river system. Or do we have a sheet geometry? Maybe you know, that would be the kind of thing we might expect to see in something like a beach setting. We'd also look for any, any evidence in the surrounding rocks. So for instance, are there any rocks that are glacially polished or that have glacial striations on them? If we do have those, then we'd say, right, well, uh, that increases the chance that this is a glacial deposit of some kind. We would also see if there were any marine fossils present, because of course, if we can find bits of shell and those organisms in the organism in question lived in a marine environment, so a saltwater environment, well, that would obviously increase the chance that we were looking at a beach deposit versus a braided river. And then we would obviously look to see if there are any indications of uni or bidirectional current flow, because of course, a, a river sediment is going to have unidirectional flow. A sediment related to a beach process, which is obviously hit by waves, is going to have a bi-directional flow. And of course, in terms of a glacier, it's just going to produce a massive structureless body of sediment. So based on the picture, there appears to be relatively little mud present, and there aren't any obvious structures. So if I had to guess, I would probably go over braided river system. Now, there's one thing that I haven't written in the text, which, can't, which I can just about see, is I think there's a good chance we may have a, pro, a, a, a texture called imbrication. So imbrication is when rocks get stacked one on top of each other, like, a, like dominoes that have fallen over. And so you can see how this rock here is leaning onto this rock here. Okay, You can see the same thing happening here. This rock is on that rock, this rock on that rock. I think there's a chance we may have some imbrication in this particular sample. And that would suggest a flow. Okay, so we've got water moving in one direction. And so that would hint at a, the braided river system being a good possibility. We can't be certain, but it's a good possibility. Now, if, if we, you know, obviously, as I said, if we had bits of shell fragments in here, that would obviously increase the chance that it was a, a, a marine sediment, a beach sediment, maybe. So we need to be careful, but as long as we you know, collect the right evidence, we can produce a relatively, you know, relatively solid model. So let's also take a second and think about the Navajo sandstone. So this is in the, uh, the west, southwestern US. So the sandstone itself is well sorted, the class are well rounded, and they range from about 0.2 to 0.5 millimeters in diameter. And, and the sediment itself is very, very quartz rich. 
Now we've already gone and discussed that well-sorted, well-rounded, very quartz-rich sandy sediments are very commonly associated with desert settings. So we also, within the rock itself, have tracks of land animals, so we know we're definitely on the continent rather than in the oceans. And we can see we have cross beds which are up to 30 metres high, so that would obviously imply very, very large dunes. And 30 metre high cross beds is on the whole a little bit too large to be forming in a river environment. So the only really logical explanation for this particular rock is that it formed in a desert setting. Now obviously we also know the cross beds themselves are dipping to the southwest, therefore we know the prevailing wind was coming from the northeast and moving in a southwesterly direction. Which is, you know, a nice piece of information to know. It helps to add to the story. So once we go around and we work out the types of environments that our layers of rock are forming in, we can use it to produce a paleogeographic map. So in order to do this, what we have to do is we have to go to multiple locations and we have to look at the layers of rock which are the same age, okay? They have to have been forming at the same time, okay? So we'll go to multiple locations and we'll find, let's say, the rocks in those sequences that date to 300 million years ago. And we will then look at those rocks and we will work out what the environment was at that point in time. And we'll do that for all of the locations. So essentially what you can do then is you, you can, um, because you've gone to all these different locations and you've worked out what the different environments are, you can put them on a map. And so what you'll begin to notice is you might see, for instance, you might start to see, you know, uh, shapes forming. So you might be able to pick out areas which are dominated by, let's say, braided river system sediments, or you might pick out areas which are dominated by floodplain sediments. And so you can instantly begin to say, right, well, 300 million years ago, this area was a floodplain. You know, it was obviously cut, you know, there's a big river moving through the area and sediment was being deposited every time it flooded. And then maybe you'll see a transition into a beach sediment, which suggests you're at the coast. And then maybe that beach sediment will then transition into a, a, a sandy marine sediment, then a muddy marine sediment, and then you might get down to turbidites. And so you'll be able to actually see, you know, where the coastline was, the water getting deeper, etc., etc. And But this entire process relies on you going to multiple locations and analysing rocks which are the same age. So... On a local scale, we can gauge climate, prevailing wind directions, rainfall, stream type, stream power, organisms, etc., etc. So just by looking at one outcrop, we can get this kind of general information. However, by looking at rocks of the same relative age from multiple locations, it's possible to determine what was happening at a local, a regional, a continental, or even a global scale. So we can, you know, we get a really good handle on what was going on in the larger system. So here are a couple of examples taken from the textbook. So we're, one, we're in the southwestern US again, and in this case we're looking at Cretaceous Age rocks. And so what you can see is geologists have been to you know, locations in all of these areas, and they've worked out what the environment of deposition was during the Cretaceous. And so what can we see? Well, we can see over here we have this band of dark green rocks. So these are interpreted as being land, moderate to low elevation, and that's, as, and that's classified as a sediment source. So this is the area being actively eroded. And then we have these lighter green areas. This is land high to moderate elevation. So we're looking at hills and mountains. So this green band represents hills and mountains. So we're going to see things like landslide deposits. We're going to see things like braided river deposits. So then along the margin of this higher ground, you can see we have this yellow area here. These represent alluvial fans once again. That would strongly suggest that what we're looking at here is some kind of transition between a higher ground over here and more kind of uh, a more planar environment over here. So then we have this light brown here. So this is non-marine. So we're looking at continental rocks. That we do think they're of coastal origin and they're primarily sandstone. So what we're looking at here is maybe some kind of desert environment or desert environment kind of grading into a beach environment. So this represents essentially a, a desert plain-like system. Now within this desert plain system we have this green area here. These are coal swamps. 
So that obviously suggests that number one, we have a body of water here because coal will tend to form in, in swampy conditions. But obviously in order to have a persistent body of water in a dried semi-desert or desert environment, you obviously need to have a river feeding it, don't you? So we know that somewhere in this area there must have been a river probably coming off the high ground, which will be essentially replenishing the water in this swampy area. It would also help it also helps us to gauge a little bit about the climate. Obviously, uh, coal swamps tend to form in hot, humid areas. So the fact that we have this coal swamp here obviously suggests the temperature was high. The fact we have these desert uh, and desert like sediments would also suggest a higher temperature. So we're in a kind of arid climate. So then we have this uh, medium brown. So this is a, a a marine sandstone, barrier island, beach or nearshore deposits. So this is our coastline. Then as we go further out, we transition from these higher energy, more sand dominated continental shelf sediments into the lower energy outer continental shelf marine muds. So we're going into deeper water. And then finally, we end up out here. We have marine calcareous mudstone. So we're heading down to the abyssal plain now. And so what you can see is in, you know, in this area during the Cretaceous, we had an, a ridge of high ground here producing sediments which were being deposited across a, a semi, you know, across a desert plain, which is probably cut by several large rivers. And then we transition straight onto a, a coastline here and then steadily we go into deeper water as we progress to the east. And this entire map is relatively simple produced and it just requires geologists to go to multiple different locations of the same age and work out what the environment of deposition was. So here we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're still in the southwestern US, but this is for the Eocene. So what can we see in this area? Well, once again, we have the we have these two brown areas here. So this is representing areas of high relief to moderate low relief. So these are the areas being eroded. So this is our high ground. So we know the conditions were hilly to maybe mountainous. We know, we can also see that what we have here in green are lots and lots of floodplain sediments. So this would suggest the area is cut by several rivers, which are occasionally flooding and covering the surrounding area in sediment. So that would imply probably meandering river systems. So we can also see that along the edge of our high ground, we have, a, we have alluvial fans. That's not really a huge shock. Obviously, sediment being eroded off the high ground will produce the alluvial fans. So everything pretty normal there. We also have extensive coal swamps with thick coal beds up here in the northeast. So once again, that would imply we're in a hot, humid climate. And once again, as we're also being able to maintain this swampy set of conditions, we would need rivers in the area and those rivers would probably have to be flowing all year round. And then finally, we also have lake deposits and we can see a lake here, a large lake here, and we have a few smaller lakes around as well. And so the fact we have these lake deposits, well, once again, that shows we have large standing bodies of water. It also implies that the water is constantly being replenished, okay, because there's no indication on this map of evaporites. So what we have here is we have a, 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 a temperate area. So conditions are warmish, but not arid. And there are, also, there are also no indications of there being any kind of freezing conditions. There's no glacial sediment. So we're looking at quite a temperate environment, kind of similar probably to modern day Houston. So, OK, so one final time, this is the uh, table from the textbook. Obviously, it lists the three different main environments, so continental environments, transitional environments and marine environments. It covers the different environments we've looked at and it covers the dominant rock types and some of the structures which we may expect to see. Okay, everybody, well, thank you for listening. So please make sure you uh, have that code word written down and stored somewhere safe because you're going to need it for the code word quiz and take care.